Hello everyone and welcome to Forensic Frenzies Idaho 4 series. Okay, so welcome everyone. Today is our very first time ever trying StreamYard. So as you see me pop in and pop out, it's going to be because this is all a test while running a video at the same time. Thank you for your patience. Anyhow, so let's just see how this looks. Let me know guys. Just kidding. See, this is why I need to practice. Anyhow, today I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Idaho Four students, the surviving witnesses, and the frat guys. So I get a lot from my viewers. Um, I'm pretty sure the ones that don't agree with me, but that's okay. I get a lot from them regarding the theories of the students being involved. Did the frat guys have this beef? Did the girls not like the other girls in the home? Is it that everyone was working together? And I want to talk about it a little bit. So I have some questions um, regarding those theories. And I'm not like disparaging the theories because I am open-minded, you know, to whomever. But I have questions. And I think that I want to talk about it because regardless of if Brian is the person who allegedly did this, or if the students are involved. I still have questions. And the fact that I still have questions, no matter what, just kind of makes me feel like not by too much can one explanation or theory be more plausible than the next. But there are some that just seem to be all the more far-fetched than others. So, I do have something I want to share with you guys today, and I just put a quick uh, presentation together with questions that I would want to ask um, to the people who pose the theories that the roommates or the frat guys or both are involved. Again, not poking and prying, not disparaging your theory, trying to understand it. So actually, if you're brave enough and you truly believe me, then leave your theory in the comments so that I can actually read through and try to see how these questions fit into the theory and what the answer actually is so that I can actually take from the questions where you develop the theory from. So let's get into this. Involvement of the roommates. So if the roommates are involved, I want to start with no matter who is involved, I want to know why it had to be done on this night. If the roommates are involved, or no matter who is involved, I want to understand the catalyst. That goes across the board, including the current defendant. I want to understand why this night and what the catalyst was. But if the roommates were involved together, Right, Because we're going to go through this as if the roommates were involved together and then as if one of them was involved but not the other. And I have questions that some are the same but some are different based upon togetherness or separation. So if they're involved together, I want to know, did they know the attackers or are they the attackers? And regardless... Why allow an eight-hour time gap before calling 911? Doesn't that make you suspicious? If you know that you did it, and you know that you're going to say you were in the house, and you're going to have this elaborate story about the man who was in the house, and you know that you called the DoorDash and set it all up, and you know all of that. So why would you not call 911 sooner? making yourself look a little less suspicious. So again, isn't that bringing suspicion upon oneself rather than removing suspicion from oneself? What were they doing in that eight hours? Because regardless of if you believe they were or were not cleaning up, a cleanup would never take eight hours. So I'm just trying to figure out and then if it's the other thing that you say it was, well, we're going to get there too. 
why would they not leave the scene? Why would they know that they had done all the things and that they're going to call 911? Someone's going to, and they stuck around. Why not pull the Emma and Demetrius, leave, and then come back and find the victims? If they did this together, <clears throat> sorry guys, then how come their stories seemingly are now mismatched? They no longer seem to have stories that would be cohesive. How did they manage to get all the steps prior adhered and yet simply their story would be the disadvantage? So if it was one but not the other, and I don't care which one, um, I want to know, since the other girl obviously did see and hear things, then she would make the perpetrating young lady's story much more difficult. Why would they spare her? So why would Dylan spare Bethany? Why would Bethany spare Dylan? And to leave another survivor in the house does replace, displace the suspicion from you, but it also, in fact, just makes you both look suspicious. So it's, you know, how was one of them, if this was one but not the other, how was one of them able to contain the unknowing witness for an eight-hour time gap to have occurred? So not only why would you spare the other girl, but why would you even choose a time when the other girl was present? Either way, like I said, what was the catalyst? But also, as far as the eight-hour time gap goes, either way, if it was to remove the illegal substances out of the home, why would they not just remove them beforehand? So rather the girls did this together or if it was one of them without the other and the other was just an unknowing witness, why would whomever was going to participate in this not remove the illegal substances from the home before ever doing this? All right, so... Now we're going to move on to something that I'm pretty sure is going to get on your nerves, and I really don't care. I've never been one to look to please people. So let's piss you right off. If the frat was involved, I need to know what the problem was. I need to know why all four students. I need to hear something better than, well, this couple aggravated someone at the frat that night and they had this obscene crush on Xana, and they had this problem with Maddie and Kaylee, and it was just the perfect concoction. I need to hear something better than that, because that is just way too many factors, and it's starting to sound a lot like the PCA that I'm reading from Brett Payne. But anyway, why leave DM and BF as witnesses? as problematic witnesses. So these frat guys, rather DM and BF, Dylan and Bethany, whether they were a part of this or not, these frat guys still left them alive. Co-defendants of them or just witnesses in the house, they still left them alive. And they are the, they are the biggest problem now. They are now an issue because now they have a guy, right? And we're all supposed to blame it on this guy. But if either one of them cracks under pressure, this, this entire thing caves. So I'm not sure why the frats would ever leave them alive as well. I'm not sure why any, it, none of it makes any sense. But let's move forward. Why not attack these people separately in like all cases, right? Because if it's the roommates or the frats, well, then it would make it, equally, if not less suspicious, 
to just attack them individually over the course of time? Why did it have to go down that night? Why did it have to be a quadruple attack? Why did it have to be so large if it wasn't someone maniacal who was hoping to create such a large scene? If it was the frats, I need to understand the knife sheath and the DNA that's on it. I need to understand how they would have obtained the knife sheath that had the DNA on it. And I don't care if the DNA got there before they ever had the knife sheath. I really don't. That's not the point. The point is, I need to know how they got blessed enough to get a knife sheath with anyone else's single source male DNA on the button snap into the crime scene. And I need to know why law enforcement would possibly care about the status of these kids' parents when most of them are not directly from Moscow. The stories of power the stories of parents protect in law enforcement protecting students, they sound similar to me. See, I was around back then. I just wasn't here with you guys. But I was here back then in Kylie Rodney. And this sounds like a lot, a lot like the Placer County princess Kylie Rodney being driven into that water by Sammy Smith simply because Sammy Smith knew she had those powerful parents who were going to be able to protect her. So, are we sure? Are we sure? Are we sure that that's going to be our all the time story? Our every incident excuse? But let's move on because I want to make less sense of this. Let's talk about the siblings who actually still support the frat guys. Let's talk about Hunter still being a part of Sigma Chi. Let's talk about Maisie still being willing to be on campus and know that her brother is a part of Sigma Chi, which means she's probably still going to Sigma Chi hanging out with those Sigma Chi guys. Huh. Let's talk about the student who said he knew what time, approximately, Xana and Ethan would have gotten home. And it sounded like from his text messages, Ethan was still at Sigma Chi at two o'clock. That student may not be a Sigma Chi member. Fair. But that student may have also known Hunter and Maisie, Hunter or Maisie, and reported that information back to Hunter and Maisie, right? Hunter and Maisie may have told their parents about 2 a.m. is when Xana and Ethan returned home. That might be why 2 a.m. is a dark hour for their family, because someone that they know directly said 145 was not correct. It was about 2 a.m. Hunter is still a part of the Sigma Chi house. He is still brethren to those boys. He is still a brother. Jasmine Kernodal still stands behind those boys. Still stands behind Jack Decor who still stands behind those boys. So if the students are involved, well, slap my ass and call me Sally. Have a good day, guys. As always, let me know what you thought of the video. 
Thanks to your support, you can now become a member of the Forensic Frenzy channel. Like, share, subscribe, and ring my bell.